Hi there, in this video we're going to talk about how we go about testing for serocorrelation but in the presence of endogenous regressors. So an example of a sort of typical endogenous regressor might be if we include a lactopendent variable for example in our model. And the sort of tests which actually are robust to the presence of endogenous regressors are frequently named after the econometr econometricians Broich and Godfrey so it's often known as the Broich godfrey test for serial correlation. So just reminding ourselves of what we had in the previous video, the idea is that we had some sort of population process, yt, which was determined by, let's say, two independent variables. So I've got x1t and x2t now in my regression equation, and some sort of error et. So notice that the only sort of difference between this regression specification and the previous one is the fact that I've included another independent variable. Okay, and the idea that we used in our previous test was that we had some sort of AR1 process of errors, whereby our errors are related to what they were in the previous period, and the strength of that relationship is given by this row here. And our errors in the previous period don't perfectly determine what errors in the next period are, so that's why I've got this sort of idiosyncratic error U. Okay, and we talked about how we could go about testing that in the presence that we don't have um, endogenous regressors, what we would do then is we would get our OLS estimates of our errors or our residuals from running an OLS equation which was like that. And then we would regress those on a constant and delta 1 times our sort of residuals in the previous period. And the idea here is that by testing for significance of delta 1, in a sense we are testing for whether rho is equal to 0 in the population. But we spoke about the circumstances under which delta 1 is, or the t-test for delta 1 is no longer valid. One of those in particular is that if we have some relationship between our x in our regression equation and our error, then it turns out that because we can't now conclude that we have the zero conditional mean of errors assumption being true, our estimates of delta 1 are actually going to be biased in this auxiliary regression. So any sort of statistics which are based on that, so the t-statistic, the f-statistic, they're all going to be biased. So we need to think about a way in which we can correct this auxiliary regression to take, into, to take this into account, really. So the idea here is that if we were to regress our error or residuals on a constant and, let's say, our original um, regressors, x1t and, let's say, x2t, as well as our sort of regression um, estimates of the error from the previous period, et minus 1, then the idea is that by including these variables in my auxiliary regression, essentially I'm allowing et to be determined by my um, independent variables, which is absolutely fine if I have endogenous regressors. That's, that's actually going to be the case if I have endogenous regressors. So by including those two terms in my um, auxiliary regression, Essentially, now, any t-tests which are conducted on, let's say, delta 2 in this particular regression are actually going to be valid because I've actually corrected for the presence of serial correlation. So what do we often mean by having endogenous variables in our regression? Well, one of the sort of ways in which typically this comes up is if we have, let's say, a lag-dependent variable in our model. So instead of having x2t, we have yt minus 1. Well, then it's easy enough just to correct our auxiliary regression for the presence there, all we do is we replace x2t by yt minus 1 and then any sort of t statistics which we use for inference on our coefficients of our errors or lagged errors in this particular regression are still going to be valid. So that's okay. So we've talked about how we make our essentially auxiliary regression robust to the presence of endogenous variables in our regression. But we haven't talked about why we particularly specify our error process as being AR1, right? This is just AR1 because my errors in period T depend on what they were in the first period before that. So that's why the sort of one's there. But why is this sort of um, given as the sort of default way in which we test for serial correlation? Well, one of them is that if I have AR1 or if I have some sort of correlation between my errors in period T and my errors in period T minus one, then that's probably also to indicative that I've got some relationship between my errors in period T and period, let's say, t minus 5, there still should show up some sort of relationship or some sort of correlation between errors in consecutive periods if I have higher order correlations. So 
in that sense, AR1 or the AR1 approximation isn't necessarily a bad one to make. But if we do suspect that there is higher order um, autocorrelated errors, then we can actually correct our process for this present. So the idea here is that let's say in our population, there is some sort of process whereby our errors are determined by what they were in the previous period and also what they were in the period before that. Right, so I've got some sort of, this is now an AR2 process. Again, don't worry if you don't know what I'm talking about when I'm referring to AR1 and AR2. The idea is that we're going to talk about that in future videos about time series. But the sort of two here means that I've got a sort of error in the previous period as well as the error in the period, two periods before that error. So here our null hypothesis is that we've got row one is equal to naught and row two is equal to naught. And our alternative is that just one of these particular rows doesn't equal naught in the population. So obviously if row equals naught in the population or row one and row two equal naught in the population, we're not gonna have serial correlation of errors. And I should probably write that we have some sort of idiosyncratic error UT there to actually take this into account. So if row one and row two are equal to zero, our error would just be given by some sort of idiosyncratic error. So you ask, how do we actually correct our auxiliary regression to take this into account, the sort of fact that we might have a higher order um, autoregressive process in our errors? Well, then that's quite easy. All we do is we just add on our sort of extra um, error term into our auxiliary regression. So we just, can, we just include delta three times, let's say, et minus two hat, right? If we suspected we had AR2 errors. Or in general, we just sort of continue going until we sort of add up to our sort of qth order um, serial correlation or qth order AR um, serially correlated errors. So then how do we go about statistically testing these coefficients? It's quite easy, really. We can either do an F test, right, because we've got multiple coefficients. But traditionally, what we do actually is, and actually the sort of explicit form of the Bruce Godfrey test, as it's normally stated, is that we form an LM statistic, which is actually equal to the number of observations in our sample minus the sort of order of serial correlation, which we expect, times the R squared of our auxiliary regression, where we have included all of the sort of Q terms in serial correlation, which we expect. And the idea is that under the null hypothesis that we don't have serial correlation, this is actually chi-squared distribution, uh, chi-squared distributed rather, with Q degrees of freedom. So if our LM statistic is greater than the 5% region for the chi-squared distribution with Q degrees of freedom, then we reject the null of having no serial correlation. Whereas if the LM statistic is less than that threshold, then we conclude that we don't have serial correlation. 